call to order. Chair Clark. Uh, here. Vice Chair Perry. Commissioner Armbruster. Here. Commissioner Lesnar Buxton. Here. Commissioner Longstreet. Here. Commissioner Martinez Cohen. Commissioner McGill. Here. Do we have any changes to the agenda? Nope. Do we have any? We do have some written communications. Please. Am I, I forget, am I supposed to comment on them at this point? The written communications are for item number four. Um, at this time, we have public comment. Any member of the public may address the commission for up to two minutes on any subject within the jurisdiction of the commission that is not scheduled for a public discussion before the commission. The total amount of time for public comments will be 15 minutes. Is anybody here to talk about something not on the agenda? Okay, thank you. Uh, do we have a youth council member? Yeah. Okay. Please come Chair forward. Chair Clark, we have um, Paula Padilla and Stephanie Jimenez Cortez who are going to tag team their presentation. Okay. All right. So, hello, Madam Chair and Commission members. Um, my name is Paula Padilla. Okay. Is it on? Okay. Um, hello, Madam Chair and Commission members. My name is Paula Padilla, and I'm a senior at San Marcos High School. I have been on the Youth Council since June 2018. My name is Stephanie Jimenez Cortez. I'm from Santa Barbara High School, and I've been on the Youth Council for six months. Okay. Um, this is our first time reporting to the Parks and Recreation Commission meeting, and we'd like to let you know that from now on, moving forward, the Youth Council We'll send two different members each month to deliver the report to Parks and Recreation Commission to give everyone an opportunity to meet all of you um, and get experience reporting to you, as well as City Council and the School Board. We would like to thank the City of Santa Barbara Parks and Recreation Department and Neighborhood and Outreach Services for funding our trip to the National League of Cities City Summit 2018 in Los Angeles that we recently attended. Four members of the Youth Council were able to attend the event that had over 3,800 city leaders in attendance. We were able to network with other youth councils and commissions from all over the United States, dealing with topics such as immigration, mental well-being, education, the opioid crisis, homelessness, mass incarceration, local government corruption, cannabis laws, and youth engagement. We met members of the Thousand Oaks Youth Commission and made it a point to let them know that our thoughts and prayers go out to everyone impacted by the recent tragedy at the Borderline Grill, as well as those dealing with the fires. We intend to keep in touch with the Youth Commission as we work towards making our community safe for everyone. Okay. Um, the Youth Council recruitment. Um, so it ended last month and we had 11 applicants from several different junior high and high schools. We are very excited to report that we had two La Cuesta High School students applicants this recruitment. There's two positions specifically for alternative high schools. Um, had been difficult to fill in this past because we had, hadn't received applicants, but this year we did. So we're happy about that. Um, with these two alternative high school students, we are confident that we will have a full 15 member council once appointments are made by city council on December 11th, with representation from all high schools. Um, we're having a women's summit this Friday. Uh, we are very happy to report that we will be part of the women's summit that Mayor Murillo is hosting in partnership with the Santa Barbara County Commission for Women. Santa Barbara Women's Political Committee and STESA standing together to end sexual assault on Friday, November 16th at the Korea Ballroom starting at lunch at 12.30 in the program starting at 1 to 4 p.m. Uh, the Women's Summit is focusing on empowerment, offering support, and providing opportunities for action. If anyone would like more information about the Women's Summit, they can call Sandy Keeveman at the number. You guys want to say the number? Okay, um, 818-404-8945. Next Monday on November 19th, Youth Council members will hold leadership training after a regular Youth Council meeting which will start at 4 p.m. and be held at the Louise Lowry Davis Center, located at 1232 Delaware Street in Santa Barbara. This training will include leadership development, effective communication, subcommittee goals and objectives and timelines for upcoming projects and activities through the end of the fiscal year. The Youth Council has also formed a gun safety ad hoc committee that is part of the Coalition Against Gun Violence Task Force, who has held meetings with Mayor Murillo, Council Members Gutierrez and Snedden, and most recently the City Attorney, Mr. John Doismas, to look into ways we can be proactive and work towards making our schools and communities safe from gun violence. 
We are discussing potential projects that may include an educational component that will work on public service announcements about the existing state law that requires gun owners to secure their firearms safely when there are minors in the home or visiting the home. The PSAs will be in both English and Spanish. Thank you. Thank you. Um, girls, thank you for coming. Um, please convey to the Youth Council um, how much I appreciate um, the work they're doing on the gun safety issue. I think it's mm -hmm. really important. And also um, a reminder that if any of your Youth Council members are interested in being on our commission mm -hmm. as a youth member, we miss not having one of you with us because okay. um, you offer a very good perspective. So. All right. Thank, thank you, you thank so you. much. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Please. Okay, just one last comment. I just want to um, commend Sorry. you for <laughs> the decision to um, share the uh, speaking responsibility and opportunity because it's uh, yeah. getting practice with public speaking is something that you know, a lot of people don't want to do, yeah. and it's a great skill to have, and I'm really I'm pleased to see that you're going to be yeah. doing it that way. All right. Thank you. Thank you. That brings us to Commissioner Committee Assignment Reports, and we'll start with uh, Jacob. I will say we unable to attend the Youth Council this month. Um, Park Foundation, the Park Foundation meeting has been postponed until after Thanksgiving, so I'll report on it next month. I believe the golf committee meeting was canceled this month. Uh, this week I attended the sea level rise um, subcommittee and the um, document about the adaptation plan is about ready to be released. It will be released publicly on um, November 26th. There's a website that you can go to to look at it. There will be press releases. Um, it's important on December 5th, there will be a workshop from 6 to 8 p.m. at the Lee Louise Lowry Davis Center. Um, this impacts our entire community and it deals with sea level rise through 2100 and um, what parts of our city will be affected and what the, what the city's plans will be. So this is the adaptation plan. There's going to be an economic portion of it and then um, some alternatives on what we can do to better our situation. So I encourage the public to get involved and learn more about it because we can't stick our head in the sand about what's coming in the future. And the public can access the sea level rise work on the city website? On the city Yes, so on the city website, November 26th, it'll go live with interactive maps about um, projections. Uh, thank you. Um, on the 1st of November, I attended the Street Tree Advisory Committee meeting. We had um, just one street tree designation change, and since it wasn't pressing, it's been deferred to next month. Um, I also attended on the 7th a meeting at the library where the chief of police was there and city public works was there and they were discussing the new location of the police station. It was very well attended by um, lawn bowling advocates and farmers market, farmers market advocates. Um, I also attended a community meeting at Ortega Park last week discussing the, the new master plan for Ortega Park, which we'll be discussing on the agenda later, so I'm not gonna go into that right now. Um, that's it for me. Do we have any commission and staff communications? Will bring us to ceremonial items? All right. Um, so the summary of council actions, they're, as, they're attached to our packet. Does anybody have any discussion or questions? Um, what's the timeline for construction on the McKenzie um, dog, off-leash dog park? Chair Clark, Commissioner Longstreet, uh, we plan to have the project construction begin after the Thanksgiving holiday, and it could be anywhere between eight and 12 weeks, probably closer to opening sometime in February. Very exciting. It's nice to add a new type of um, facility for residents, so thank you. You're welcome. 
Okay, um, we have the minutes attached from last month's meeting. Would anyone care to make a motion to approve those minutes or have any questions? Uh, I'll make a motion to approve. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Okay, um, that brings us to our director's report. Chair Clark and commissioners, we, we placed one uh, activity on the director's report for this month. It is a project that was in the planning for some time, came to fruition as a result of a donation. So we like to highlight and thank people in the, in the general public that, that give funds to a, a enhance and advance um, a park or recreation area. And in this case, it was the Children's Garden, which is located on the Lower West Side. About 28 volunteers and staff were out cleaning it up, trimming trees, doing new planting beds, prepping the area for um, an after-school program that will be developed by our recreation staff and our neighborhood and outreach services program. So just want to highlight the tremendous amount of work. It's very colorful if you have a chance to wander by. Um, it's essentially at the end of Rancheria Street right before you turn and can go on to um, Wentworth. And uh, I think it was a great a morning activity. Quite a bit of work was done, so we're pleased with the outcome. Thank you to Mr. Trent Trenholm, who made the donation. That's great. That's correct. Wonderful. Thanks. All right. That brings us to our Ortega Park Master Plan presentation. Also have an um, interpreter here that's available to translate. Thank you, Madam Chair. I will make a bilingual announcement. These proceedings will be provided simultaneously in Spanish. If any one of you prefers to hear the whole meeting in Spanish, you go back there, you have earphones. There is an interpreter downstairs doing the whole proceeding in Spanish. If you decide that you want to come to the microphone and express yourself in Spanish, then I will come here and do consecutive interpretation for you from Spanish to English and from English to Spanish as the proceeding goes on. My name is Carlos Cerecedo. I'm a course certified interpreter translator, Judicial Council Certification 300249. Vamos a tener esta, estos procedimientos totalmente en español. Si prefieren escucharlos en español, van allá atrás y van a tener los audífonos que pueden escuchar toda la audiencia interpretada simultáneamente en español en los audífonos allá atrás. Si prefieren venir al frente y hablar en español, yo personalmente les voy a hacer lo que se llama interpretación consecutiva para ustedes con el panel y el panel lo que hablan en inglés al español. Yo soy Carlos Cerecedo, intérprete de traductor ju jurídico con una certificación 30249. Thank you, gracias. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hanna. Good afternoon, Chair Clark and Commissioners. Rich Hanna, Assistant Parks and Recreation Director, and I'm here with George Thompson, our Project Management Supervisor, to take you through a, a short presentation today on the Ortega Master Plan um, changes from the last time we were here at Commission back in August. So tonight's presentation is going to focus a little bit on what has changed since that August meeting, um, refinements to the conceptual plan that you uh, directed staff to move forward with and continue to refine, next steps for this project moving forward, and at the end we'll be looking for a recommendation from the Commission to City Council to advance this project further forward. So just by way of where we've been since we were here in August. So we had a special commission and NAC meeting in August. Um, following that meeting, we went out and had a separate meeting, subsequent meeting at Ortega Park. We hosted it actually in the park. Um, the primary focus was that was to address concerns for access for youth serving groups um, that typically use Ortega. And we also had wanted to get out there and say that, you know, the park was never intended to be closed. So that was um, some misinformation we wanted to redirect the community back to. At that time of the meeting, we had 65 members show up and it was a productive meeting and we continue to include all of that communication as our master plan continues to move forward. So in September, we spent some time redefining the design of the master plan, which you'll see tonight. Uh, in October and November, we were at the Architectural Border Review for general uh, concept review. We received favorable support, um, and George Thompson can speak a little bit to that as we advance through the presentation tonight. And then last week, as 
Uh, Chair Clark mentioned we held another community meeting uh, at the Ortega Welcome House. We had 12 residents show up for that, and the focus for that meeting was more on neighborhood compatibility and, and um, the connection between the, the neighborhood and the park and what it means to them. Just as a reminder, these are two subsequent meetings to the 10 stakeholder meetings that we've held previous to this time, the two community meetings when we've had well over 150 in-person participants just for the Ortega meetings, online survey that reached out to 400 respondents, and um, I feel like the department has really tried to reach out to the community in a number of different ways and times and locations to get this input as we advance the project forward. So just side-by-side -side illustrations, I just wanted to cover a couple of things. So the illustration or the picture on the left-hand side of the screen as you look at it over here, I wanted to point out a couple of things. When you look at the two park images side by side, although the layout changes and, and the amenities look new and enhanced and refreshed, a lot of the same components and the amenities in the park continue through both designs. So you've got both a, a youth baseball field here over in the picture on the left that's being carried forward to the conceptual design over here. This whole turf area out here is what we would currently consider uh, uh, informal multi-turf space, meaning anybody can use that for any range of turf activities. We have basketball courts over here by the Welcome House, and we're carrying that concept forward to this concept design over here. We have the swimming pool over here, Ortega Park swimming pool, much loved. Uh, again, much larger swimming pool complex, but located over here in this part of the park. And then lastly, just we've got the children's playground that currently exists over here. And again, we're carrying that concept forward to uh, this part of the concept design. The, the point that I'm trying to make here is a lot of the amenities that we're including in Ortega as we advance it forward currently exist. And I think our focus is really to kind of look at how they can be better, better placed in the park and really enhance increased activity and promote that within the park. As we go through the next concept designs, we'll spend a little bit more time talking about specific features as it relates to the changes we've made since August. So just one of the things I think that's resonated the most as we've gone through our uh, master plan process in addition to parking, which you'll hear about later, um, is the multi-sport artificial turf field. And I just wanted to get out and say that this isn't designed to be a regional sports complex. It's not the Dwight Murphy that you saw as part of the co-presentation back in August. This is really a, a, a recreation space designed to be used by youth groups primarily in the neighborhood. Um, it is anticipated that some people will travel to this site to participate in activities, but it's not designed to be a regional place where every weekend there's a large tournament, whatever sport turf type activity it is. Um, the focus is to maximize recreation space for all user groups and not just what you see illustrated in this. Obviously, you can see that it's set up to illustrate soccer and youth baseball, but we've also got youth lacrosse, youth rugby, and a bunch of other youth groups that could benefit from additional turf space in this community. One of the key things that we did between the last meeting and this meeting is we went back and we reoriented, reoriented the, the actual turf space based on some feedback we received. So if you look to the top of the screen up here, which is closest to the junior high, we actually expanded that. We had heard there needed to be space with inside the, the fenced area for people to actually sit and participate and spectate. Um, we also shifted the field uh, closer to Ortega Street, which is over here. And what that's enabled us to do is capture this section, which ex already has existing trees and grass, and actually leave that as natural turf, which is one of the other things that we've heard throughout this presentation. A couple of other th key things to point out is, although the field is oriented to pretty much run, I guess in this case, north and south, um, you'll see these dotted lines in here. You'll see, and it pretty much makes up three smaller sports fields. So one of the things we were talking to the commission about when we were here last time is there's just an, a, a, a current demand and need for practice space more so than probably anything else. And so here's a field that allows you to have multi-type activities, both whether you're playing linear wise or width wise and just for the benefit of people watching at home the full field size is 405 feet by 203 feet the three smaller fields are 185 feet by 120 square feet and they still provide for spectators both in between when people are playing width wise 
One of the other things that we're still moving forward and proposing is sport lighting, and that's for evening permitted play. Um, so that's still included in this design as it moves forward. And I wanted to talk a little bit about access. So whether this is synthetic or natural turf, um, which we'll evaluate in the next phase of this project, the survey that we did came back pretty much split 50-50 between natural turf and synthetic turf. Irrespective of the turf type that we put here, the demand's going to increase. It's going to be the newest, greatest park. So whether it's synthetic or natural turf, we just know that the demand will increase at this location. But we've actually increased the field space as a whole in general. So the field space as a whole is increased. We know there's going to be a demand there. Um, but two key things to keep in mind, artificial turf or synthetic turf, if we move forward with that, allows for year-round play and it provides a stable playing condition throughout the year. If we move forward with natural turf, um, currently what we're experiencing in all of our uh, other sport fields and locations in our complexes, and we're using the recently renovated Cabrillo Ballpark as a good design of that, um, we anticipate that the field would need to be closed for about four months a year annually to actually rehabilitate it back to a level that's safe for play and to manage activity moving forward. So I just wanted to provide that for some perspective. In respect to permitting, I think there's some, um, there's some benefits to permitting, whether it's formal or informal use at this field going forward. The goal is obviously to increase activity within the park. The biggest challenges for uh, park demand typically are the after school hours and on weekends. Uh, and then with the addition of the sports lighting into those evening hours. So as we move this forward, the department will continue to look at how we balance that formal and informal use, that evening permitted play. And I would just remind the commission that from 2000 to 2014, the department actually played that role for the school district and we actually permitted all of their junior high fields um, throughout their network of fields. And so the way that we did that is twice a year, we would sit down with large user groups. We would receive all of their requests at the same time. We would allocate out equitable playing time and use and access to the fields. And we always prioritize youth groups for the after school hours into the early evening hours. And then the adult play, which would typically come when the lights came on, would be the later part of the evening up to 10 p.m. Is, was the latest time that we use those fields. So looking from Ortega and Salsa Puedes, so this might be the first time you've seen this architectural rendering. So this is obviously new. Everything looks bright and shiny. This is just one step of the process. Um, we're required to provide these types of renderings when we go to ABR to give some context to the park and what it's going to look like so they can help evaluate the process. Um, what I would say is it also gives you a perspective of how all of the amenities within the park relate. And when you look at a flat plan, like I showed you before, you, you don't get a sense of space and connectivity and, and how circulation may work around the park. So again, just to, just to draw you back in, here's your multi-sport sport field, the junior high over here, swimming pool on this corner, the skate park, which is actually over here and then the basketball court. This middle quadrant would be at this point as a playground and may include some sort of a splash playground. So some of the key things to take away from this slide is the repurpose of the welcome house. You can kind of see how it's gonna be the hub for how people will enter the park pool area, um, how that will actually provide uh, controlled access to the actual pool, but if we design it in such a way that allows for flexible use, it could also support things like birthday parties and other community meetings, meaning that we're keeping a fixture that's already currently in the park, but enhancing how that will interact with the neighborhood. The other change over here is the swimming pool and slide area. So when we came to you in August, we actually had those, the uh, we had a swimming pool, then we had a splash playground, and then we had a, a hydro slide, water slide that was kind of separate in its olden tank. As we have moved this process forward, we've had to pick up some room that includes a mechanical building, which is over here, um, which would be noise proof. So any sort of mechanics operating the pool and filtr filtration equipment wouldn't carry across the street to the neighbors. We've had to add restrooms and locker room changes over here. And then this building in the back here is the restroom facility, which is actually going to be designed so one half of it will serve the pool area and the other side will actually serve the park area for the skate park, the basketball courts, the field users, and so forth. Again, trying to minimize structures within the park but repurpose what we currently have. 
um, there'd be a simple wall in the middle that would allow those two types of activities to be uh, taking place concurrently and symbiotically. So when you look at the pool, just a couple of other features, um, because of the additional facilities we've had to add with inside the fence perimeter of the swimming pool, we've asked our architects to uh, show this section over here, which is a zero depth beach entry type swimming facility, uh, and then some actual splash pad recreation fun amenities at this end of the pool. So we're trying to combine that wading slash swimming slash splash, pay, splash pad concept into one swimming pool design. You would still have some sort of a divider here. It could be a rope. It could be some sort of stainless steel uh, bars. Informal swimming pool. So you could do laps, recreation swim for in the summertime. Uh, we'd have the ability to do aqua aerobics and senior programming throughout the day. Uh, and then over here is just really your splash containment area for anybody that's using the slide. The splash pad that was included over here where the restrooms and locker room facilities are, we're now showing back in the central plaza. Um, we're going to continue to evaluate that as we've gone through the West Beach splash playground design. We're starting to learn about the cost for these things, code requirements as it relates to restrooms and other things. And so we're still showing it in the design at this point, but we've taken it away from being adjoined specifically to the swimming pool. I talked briefly about the restrooms and then um, the other thing that we've heard about the most in this entire presentation other than the sports multi-sport field is parking. It's been like the number one thing both currently for the community, for those that live around there, and then for any sort of future development as it relates to this park. So at this point, I'm going to transition over to George Thompson and then I'll come back at the end of the presentation. Thank you. So regarding parking, we originally had two concepts. One of the concepts showed parking within the park itself, and really the trade-off there becomes trading recreation space for parking. Um, that wasn't widely supported through the online um, surveys, and so what we're looking at now is how do we maximize available parking currently? So how do we increase that parking and make it more efficient as well? And so if you look at the actual block lengths, so the curbs along Salsa Puedes and Ortega Streets, there's Salsa Puedes and then Ortega Street. Again, what we're proposing to do is rotate the parking so it's either 90 degree in, such as it's shown on Salsa Puedes here, or it would be angled parking on Ortega Street. And what that does is it allows us to maximize recreation space while simultaneously maximizing the amount of parking. Um, this is a different view. So this is from Coda and Salsa Puedes. Um, again, showing the parking there, but really what we want to illustrate here is one of the main themes that came up through the workshops is how do we get neighborhood connection to the park, improve it over its current um, situation. And so part of that is providing active walking space and pedestrian corridors throughout the park for people, whether they're um, neighbors or people from, let's say, the junior high getting off school, how do they get to the park amenities in an enjoyable way? And so you do see a, a main promenade there, and I'll talk about that in a future slide as we talk about um, the neighborhood uh, identity and how we design that space. So looking at passive recreation, walking, enjoying open space, we also have the active recreation component. So you can see clearly the basketball area. Um, we still retain the multi-sport leisure activity area, such as uh, cornhole or beanbag toss. That's just off to the right of the basketball court area, ping pong, uh, bocce ball. And then to the left of the main promenade there, behind the trees, you can see the skate park area. And part of the landscape rendering here is showing not only the flowers and shrubs that would would become part of the landscape, but also the trees. And so there are ways to design areas within the park that are potentially noise generators um, to be more landscape to try to reduce some of that noise. It's not going to take away all of that noise, but it's definitely a design consideration. In addition to um, that aspect of it in terms of designing for noise, um, we also look at park hours, so going forward, how is the park going to be managed? And that's a major component. Right now, 
through the master plan design process, we're really looking at the main building blocks of the park. What is the community proposing? What do they support? And that really defines the master plan. As we get in the next phase, we're talking more about the technical design, but we also have to talk about the management of the park, and that includes hours. Um, currently, the park is closed half hour after sunset, but there's no way to physically keep people out that shouldn't be there because the park is closed. So the plan still includes fences around the perimeter of the park, which are actually shown in this rendering. They're obviously softened by the landscape, um, and then gates that would be closed when the park um, is closed down. And again, if um, a permitted activity is booked for the park, the park would be open for that specific activity. Okay, um, during really the past, well, since the beginning of the master plan design process, neighborhood compatibility has always been um, at the forefront of our minds, but also at the forefront of public comment and input. So parking, we've talked about that. Just want to reiterate that parking is a major consideration as this project moves forward. Noise, I touched on briefly, particularly for this skate park area, because that has been um, a consistent comment. But we also have to look at other areas, such as basketball, the other active recreation areas, such as the swimming pool, um, the playground. How do we manage those areas to reduce noise and design them to reduce noise so that the impacts on neighbors are reduced? Um, at last Thursday evening's meeting um, and the August on-site meeting, um, a lot of the community members that came really spoke to the significance of Ortega Park as an east side ins institution, as a cultural center for the neighborhood. And that's something that we want to move um, forward in the design process is how do we capture the areas that are sensitive um, for neighbors in terms of there's a long history of use there. There are um, such as barbecues, family gatherings, uh, other cultural events. How do we design those new spaces to reflect the neighborhood uh, identity, um, enhance them to allow for that um, enhanced use? Um, aside from the social gatherings, such as picnics and other uh, events like that, we also have community um, gatherings that are revolved around uh, sporting events. And so the image up at the upper right is um, the Laguna Ball Park, which was not in Ortega Park, but a, a, about a block away. But really the focus there was it was a sporting event, a sporting venue that was community-based. And so a lot of folks in our community remember that park. Um, going forward, we would be looking at enhancing youth sports as a social gathering um, area. And then we have these great murals that are shown on the left side there. Um, how do we develop new murals? How do we replace murals that may need to be moved? Or how do we preserve murals that are important currently? Um, and so that's really going to be part of a focused design moving into the preliminary design stage. OK, so next steps, we're uh, scheduled to go to city council in January, so just a couple months away. And really what we're asking city council to do is to advance the preliminary design. So taking this master plan as basically a roadmap for Ortega Park and advancing it to preliminary design. And so that means engaging in a variety of technical studies that are required to get to that next stage of design, including looking at the soils, um, looking at parking studies and parking impacts and how do we maximize parking on site looking at potential impacts from lighting, whether it's site lighting for pedestrian access or sport uh, field lighting. How do we minimize the off-site impacts? And through those technical studies, we'll have basically design modules or focused design for areas such as the swimming pool. That's a specialized area of design. Um, sports fields is another specialized area. So not only will we have a professional designer, but it also means going out to all of the folks that have been part of the community engagement process, the sports youth sports teams, bringing them into focused design meetings so that 
everybody's um, providing input in what will eventually be uh, the redesigned Ortega Park. So it also includes um, the skate park aspect. It's a, a more of a complicated design process for that area and then the playground area as well. Um, so we've got several um, steps to go before the project is built, obviously, quite a few steps to go. Um, we're looking at community access, so things that Rich talked about, dealing with the access and permitting use um, aspects of park management. We've got architectural board review to review the design. They're going to be providing a lot of input on the preliminary design, the final design as it goes forward. We're going to be at planning commission. Um, we've got a permitting phase with the building department, feasibility, costing, and then obviously phasing. How do we construct this project in a way that makes sense and that is uh, cost effective? So regarding the budget, um, the $169,000 uh, is basically for this portion of the design that we're basically going to be culminating um, or finishing up in January with the presentation to city council. So that's with RRM design group, uh, landscape architects, civil arc, uh, engineers, and the public engagement process. We still have $270,000 in general fund that we would request city council approve the next stage of design. And that's the January meeting is just starting that process. And then we also have an existing community development block grant. So $146,000 that we're going to be asking city council to dedicate that money to look specifically at the public right of way improvements. And so public right of way really means the street, the public parking and sidewalk areas fronting the park. And the reason we want to do that is really getting back to the parking issues and the neighborhood compatibility with access to the park. Putting that on the front end of the design really enables the envelope of the park to be set and then all of the things that happen within the park can then proceed for design after the sidewalks, parking, and so forth are designed. So as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, um, we'll be looking for a recommendation from the Commission to City Council that the department proceed with advancing the preliminary design of the proposed park improvements. And at this time, we'd be happy to answer any questions from the Commission. So, so the way it'll work is we'll, we'll open this up to questions from commissioners and then we'll have public comment and then we'll bring it back to the commission. Um, would anyone like have questions for Mr. Hanna or Thompson? I do have a question. Looking at the, the pool area, is that able to be separated from the welcome house so that the welcome house can be rented on its own or are, do they, does it come as a whole unit? Chair Clark and Commissioner Longstreet, so at this time we're showing that the Welcome House is really uh, the entryway to the swimming complex. Um, so it would have some means of actually controlling entry and exit from the pool, which is a code requirement. I think as we move this forward, we'll be looking at a way that parts of that building, potentially even 50% of that building, could be used in such a way that it doesn't open up to the pool for safety reasons. But if an event was to be there that wanted to use the pool, they could also then make their way back out into the lobby and into the pool space. Um, so the goal with the Welcome House is, in addition to repurposing it, is to make it as, as flexible as possible while still meeting the health code requirements for an aquatic center. Thank you. Um, and with the artificial turf, would the areas surrounding the field be um, natural grass or would you turf kind of that whole area to make it more flexible? So if you look up in this design, this, as I called out before, this area here would be natural turf. Um, right. We're also showing natural turf down this side, which is closest to the junior high here as well which is outside the fence line. Um, there's a natural small buffer over here on Ortega Street. Um, and then this grass area here that is uh, more in the plaza area separated by that would also be, it's, we're looking at that being natural turf also. 
So the synthetic turf, if this moves forward, is really defined by the perimeter fencing for the multi-sport field. Thank you. Thank you. I had a question. At the community meeting last week, you said there was 13 or 17 rentals over the last year of the Welcome House. Was that the number you gave? So Chair Clark and Commissioners, so in the last, I want to say it was, I gave the number over a two-year period. There's been 13 event rentals in the Welcome House. Um, so we've recently started permitting a church group that actively uses it on Saturday and Sunday nights. But, you know, at one point this building was kind of the, the hub for activity in the park and so forth. Um, and due to misuse behaviors and you could make a case that parking impacts it as also, but I'd say primarily due to misuse behaviors in the park, the rental of that facility has significantly declined. You anticipate that if the, the park is, if we increase um, the uses that we want to see in the park, there'll be more rentals of the welcome house. If there's less misuse, the people will come back. Correct. And start using I, it. I, correct. And I think that's just a general concept with any park and recreation space that we undertake through master plan or development is the more activity we can put in the park, the more typically it, it dissuades misuse behavior. So we would anticipate not only the welcome house, but also the plaza areas as George described earlier that may have group picnic sites or barbecue areas mm -hmm. to really meet that community need and increase those types of activities in the park. Thank you. Does anyone else have a question? Um, yeah, I'm noticing some of the concerns are also losing, um, I've read and heard, losing community feel and community kind of informal access. Um, with the planned facilities, what do you think the impact, do you have a feeling for what the impact would be on the amount of available space for, let's say, informal, unpermitted activities, more casual neighborhood activities? Commissioner McGill and, and Chair and Commissioners, um, I think one way to look at this is to really focus in on the current areas that are really focused for a community space. So we've got the Welcome House. Um, this was formerly the picnic area. And those tables were removed. Um, looking at areas where we could develop new picnic areas and focus community space. We've got this main promenade. We also have this area here. So if you envision um, a community festival or other large gathering, these would be great spaces for that with vendors or booths um, being able to set up here. There's this main central plaza area. And so what's shown right now are basically shade sales and picnic area. We've got um, the playground, which in and out of itself is really going to be a gathering space for primarily families. We've got the pool area, which currently is being designed to include gathering spaces such as this shade trellis, lawn area. Um, Rich mentioned the welcome house would really be a focused uh, rental space. This area right here next to the proposed skate park area. This is actually a large viewing area. And then we have this active recreation area, which is another gathering area for folks that are involved in leisure sports, such as beanbag toss or bocce ball. So when I reference the actual design of those areas, that's when we take the next step to make sure that it's designed in a way that encourages community building, that encourages gatherings, both in the physical layout of the amenities, but also in public art, murals, the way that they actually look when, it, when uh, the design is complete. All right, if nobody else has a question, I'm gonna open up public comment. Are we good? I'm good. Okay. Um, the first speaker I have in front of me is Sebastian Aldana. Hello, 
everybody. How are you? My name is Sebastian Aldana. I am an Eastside uh, resident. I'm just uh, three blocks from there. And uh, I have attended all five meetings uh, for the most part. I, I do approve. Um, I would like to see the splash pads in question included. Um, yeah, and, and this is more for, for the kids because the area is becoming very dense and uh, little kids, they need area for, to flap their wings a little bit, you know. Uh, in all, all of the five meetings I have mentioned if, if Quarantina Street could be opened and, that, and it could be one way, whatever way the professionals feel it needs to be, but I, uh, it could be one way going towards the, the Santa Barbara High School and use that as a drop off instead of in front of Santa Barbara Junior High currently, because currently the, what should be a bike lane is a drop off and, and when people are using the bike lane uh, they're picking up kids, and and it, it just it, that 700 block in front of the junior high is a big cluster. And if it could be a one way, one lane with a bike lane, and then also a drop off, if there's a way to make that happen, uh, I think we can. You will have a complete bike lane on Coda Street, from Milpas all the way to Chapala. It'll be complete. Uh, Regarding the murals, uh, maybe you can talk with the uh, artists, you know, that have uh, put in their time there. Uh, I know there was, uh, back in the 70s, there was an artist from um, Puerto Vallarta, uh, being um, that uh, Santa Barbara and Puerto Vallarta sister cities, so they worked on it together. So there's a lot of history there, and, and that should be um, taken into consideration. But um, for the most part, I do approve it. It's looking very nice. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question, Mr. Aldana, yes. about the quarantina. At the um, Ortega side, there is a drop-off, right? There's that turnaround where parents can go in and drop kids off, right? Oh, okay, but... If they come a, down on... Yeah, the but there's a lot of use on Coda. I live on Coda. I'm yeah. uh, two, two, actually two is, blocks. I'm on the 900 block. The, pr the problem is the 700 block. Okay. And but, there's a lot of commuters, you know, going to the Riviera also. It's yeah, I just wonder if that isn't something that could be dealt with at the junior high with educating parents to use a drop-off where we wouldn't u lose the it, space. Yeah, or plan B, C, D. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Sure. Um, Rube Estes. Thank you, commissioners, for committing your time and also for considering the preliminary design of Ortega Park. I've had the pleasure of being a part of this process led by the city staff, and I really feel that they've made a consorted effort to be inclusive, communicative, the equitable opportunities for dialogue and conversation, and I'm really grateful for that, so thank you. Um, I'm not a skateboarder, uh, but over the last 10 years, I have been working with early child development, youth development, and family support services. And in that time, I've learned that access has to be defined through three lenses. Uh, first of which is financial, second, physical, and most importantly, social and emotional. Skateboarding achieves all of those. Uh, materials are affordable, especially with a caring skateboarding community that continues to advocate for and support the next generation of skaters. Access is also physical, as we talked about. And as our days and our generation of being able to venture miles in cities are far gone and Skaters Point is overflowing um, as a destination park at this point, our youngest are in search of a neighborhood park, uh, one that they can call their own and one that they can get to safely. Access is also social and emotional and skateboarding is a lot more than physically healthy activity. It builds a community, one that is inviting to those of us that don't fit into team sports and constant socialization, but it also is for those who ease into social norms as well. What I'm asking today is please to commit to the component of skateboarding and the skate park at Ortega with intention. If possible, consider enlarging the allocation of space when you get into the design. 
phase and also consult with the neighborhood continuously as you have done so far and also the skateboarding community, many of whom have also continued and diligently attended all of the meetings, the public meetings, commission meetings. Uh, some of them are here today. They may be quiet, but they will continue to show up for the kids and the grums, so thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Uh, Mr. Jeremy Corey. Great, that's enough. Oh, yes, <laughs> sorry. Hi, how's it going? Thank you for letting me speak. I actually live on the corner of Quarantina and Coda, so where that traffic jam actually is is my house. But I'm not here for that, really. The parking doesn't bother, or the traffic in the morning. It's mostly the parking is my issue. Is As everybody knows, homeless vagrants in the park during the day usually, so they usually park in their cars and sleep at night and then they get out of their cars and get straight into the park so what i'm proposing to you guys is just like dwight murphy since the parking will now be in park territory you can close the parking at night from dusk till dawn or 10 to 10 or whatever it may be and then have it neighborhood permit parking so there's no way you should be parking by that park that's not a resident and that might relieve some of the tensions with the people hanging out in the park all day because they don't ever have to leave right now. So if they have to leave at night and go park somewhere else, they probably won't just drive back in the morning to hang out. And then also on Quarantina Street, they eminent domain the driveways to make the street a little wider for the cobblestone. So I don't have a driveway anymore anyway. So at night, it's sometimes hard to find parking when the homeless are parked there. And... Even if it was just uh, through two blocks, I'm pretty sure if they did any kind of survey, I bet you it would be 98% in favor of some kind of permit parking for around the park. Other than that, love the project. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Gray. Um, and next, uh, George Nagai. Uh, hello, my name is George Nagai. I wanna start by thanking City Parks Rec um, council and staff for your continued support of skate parks in Santa Barbara. I'm very excited about the revamp of Ortega Park. Um, our city needs quality venues for active recreation, promoting healthy lifestyles, and enhancing the culture of Santa Barbara. The inclusion of a skate park here will help to satisfy the demand for safe and legal places for skateboarding while simultaneously complementing the other athletic features of an upgraded Ortega Park. A skate park at Ortega Park will provide easy access for skate enthusiasts who work and or reside downtown, especially the students of neighboring Santa Barbara Junior High. Um, can you envision the programming opportunities here, uh, things such as Santa Barbara Junior High Skateboarding Club and other such things? Uh, some may remember the success of Skate Cipuetas, the modest but well-used skate park at Ortega Park housed, uh, that Ortega Park housed back in the 90s. Um, skateboarding has only grown in popularity since then, and with the introduction of skateboarding to the 2020 Summer Olympics, we are certainly ready for the release of Skate Cipuetas 2.0. I do know that we are not in the design phase yet, but if I could promote but one idea, uh, let's think big. Larger skate parks are more effective by safely accommodating more users, offering a greater variety of terrain, and overall more fun. I do love Skaters Point, and I was involved in the design of it, um, but at 14,000 square feet, it is often overcrowded, making it dangerous to navigate, and admittedly, it is somewhat dated in design. That's not to say that Skaters Point isn't a good park, it simply shows that the size and the terrain do not meet the demands of uh, the community today. Examples of other California cities working to develop better skate parks would include Santa Monica, which opened their 20,000 square foot skate plaza back in 2010, and Linda Vista, which just opened their 35,000 square foot skate park in January of this year. Today, skateboarders are looking for both street elements, such as ledges, rails, stairs, embankments, and more, as well as the curved transitions of bowls, ramps, and pipes to practice their majestic maneuvers on. A larger, well-designed skate park would be able to accommodate these needs, making it more triumphant for the entire community. Again, I support a new skate park at Ortega Park and also encourage Santa Barbara to maximize this opportunity by making a 20 to 30,000 square foot skate park incorporating bold and innovative designs. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, 
Sean Bullis. Hello there. My name is Sean Bullis. I'm 34 years old, been a resident of Santa Barbara for uh, 34 years. Um, I'm a proud parent of my eight-year-old son. And I look at new parks and new skate parks and outdoor activities specifically for the youth. And I look at my son, um, his future, and what is he going to be doing in eight years or whatever it may be when he becomes a teenager. And I work, I, want, I uh, received this uh, 2014 uh, Santa Barbara Spirit of Service Award for keeping Santa Barbara clean and um, youth and involving the youth and whatnot. And um, as George mentioned about like the skate club at uh, Santa Barbara Junior High, I actually uh, volunteer to run that every uh, Friday at lunchtime. Um, and <clears throat> the need for skateboarding in this town, a lot of kids are intimidated by the skate park or, or whatnot because it's so small and there's so many people. Um, as George was um, saying about the uh, bigger is better, of course, because um, you have more variety, you have more space and whatnot. Um, but my main concern, too, is with the, all the video games and, and whatnot with the, with the youth. Um, it's really keeping them inside. And I feel like that's just the youth needs to be exercising, needs to be out and about and being creative. And skateboarding brings a creative light into, into every skateboarder's life. And um, it's something that you can only get better at. You don't decrease unless you just completely stop and can come back. Um, but for confidence and balance and whatnot. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I thank you guys for creating this. I mean, it's beautiful and it's gonna make the community thrive and the youth thrive. And I feel like a state of the art kind of uh, park like this will um, push out those that are lurking in the, in the shadows and whatnot. And I know we will all be committed to uh, shooing those guys out you know the bad people or whatever and uh because we're working hard for it we're here in the support and we're all here for the kids thank you thank, thank you. you mr Bowles. Uh and that brings us back to the commission for discussion yes oh was there anybody else that wanted to speak that didn't have a speaker slip Yes, please. Um, can you fill one out afterwards okay, and give yeah, it to me? Okay. Sure. Um, hi, I'm Kathleen Wolpe. Um, and we, I think the concern with uh, parking is that I represent Action Roofing, so we're a business there. Um, and so every day we have to commute, and like I, I park my car around that area. Could and you so, speak into the mic? Sorry. I can't hear you. I'm sorry. Um, so our concern is with permit parking and things like that, us having us being able to have some sort of parking there as well because we struggle to find parking in the mornings um who are you with i'm with action roofing okay. um and so we have i mean our we have 100 employees that are all coming in you know so um i just like that to be brought into consideration when if there is going to be residential permit parking is that something that's available for the people um you know who work there or how exactly that works and also maybe to just just have as a consideration when you're when you're developing your plans thanks thank you okay i think uh, commissioner mcgill had a question actually i have two questions just to follow up on some of the comments um first question is on state parks you guys i certainly proud and strong advocates for skateboarding and skate parks. Um, so we just heard a specific recommendation for a think big 20 to 30,000 square foot skate park. What is the, um, it's probably in there and I forgot, but what is the square footage as currently? The, the square footage out? currently is about 12,000 square feet and that's really the kind of skatable part of it. It doesn't include the viewing area and so forth, but really at a concept level, that's what we're working with. So to do, I mean, you're effectively talking about doubling it to to do go to the, the think big option. What would have to go away to make that possible? I don't know. <laughs> it's a simple answer. I mean, at this point, 
it would be a, a process and really going back out to the community to look at all the various options. And then my second question, which is a reasonable answer, second question is on the parking and the possibility of permit parking. Um, I guess the one of its procedural is that even a parks and rec, um, is that even in your purview to do that? And then are things like um, resident permit parking at night or after a certain, between the, you know, certain hours at night, is that something that is possible to consider? Chair Clark and Commissioner McGill, it's not something that Parks and Recreation does. I can tell you that we have been working very closely with our colleagues in Public Works Transportation. Um, they, in fact, have helped us figure out how to, to create the parking that's proposed as part of the master plan. They are also well aware from the neighborhood um, the desire to pursue the potential for permit parking. There is a process by which that happens. Um, certainly, we will continue to take that forward as a desire that's coming from the neighborhood. I don't anticipate that the desire to figure out parking is going to abate anywhere in the city, and so part of it is, is being strategic. And clearly, in this location, there's a variety of factors um, that impact residents as it relates to the use of parking for a variety of non-residential uses. Um, I, I thought I um, I'm not sure if you spoke to it today, Mr. Hanna, about possibly using the Santa Barbara Junior High lot as a parking. Sure, situation. Chair Clark and Commissioners. So I think in our first presentation back in August, and then I think at the community meeting the other night, um, the department, the city as a whole, actually have a joint use agreement with the Santa Barbara Unified School District, and so one of the opportunities would be to explore using the junior high parking lot at times when there's not school in session. So that would be, you know, that would certainly benefit any sort of increased use after school hours when parking could be desirable into the evening hours and then also on weekends and the summer holidays and other Christmas breaks and the like. My question about that was how would people going to use Ortega Park that were driving there, how would they be aware of that opportunity? Would there be signage at those parking spaces along Ortega or Salsa Puedas or would it be in the park, how would how would people know that that was an option? So I I so at this point I couldn't commit to what it's going to look like, but I I think as the process moves forward, and we know we're going to have to address parking as a whole, that would be one of the things that we actually need to flush out and what it's going to look like and what those hours would be. We have not because we're still in the preliminary phase. We haven't engaged with the district specifically about parking at the junior high, so I don't want to speak for the district at this point. Thank you. Chair Clark, if I could just add, um, knowing just how this is going to continue to be a discussion point, for good reason, of course, uh, I think if you think, you know, consider some of the places that you might have been yourself and, and you know you're going to participate in a program at XYZ location and parking is something that needs to be considered, there's generally direction through that parking is available at. So that I think we can easily, whatever solutions we do come up with, we can communicate that through the program materials, through our working with youth groups and sports groups. I think it'll be fairly easy to disseminate that kind of information. Thank you. As we're on the parking theme, um, I watched the ABR deliberations and, and it did concern me when ABR mentioned this increased parking um, helping to relieve what they know is residential parking problems from the projects coming forward. You know, that they have AUD projects going in with lower levels of parking and that we're going to be providing it. I see this parking as for the park. I would like to see it timed at 90 minutes during the day so that someone can get to swim lessons, someone can drop their child off to skate or to go to a soccer park for a soccer game for an hour and be in and out. Um, what happens afterwards I think is definitely up to the neighborhood um, to organize as far as permit parking. I think we see that in plenty of neighborhoods in our community and it takes neighborhood organization to do that. I know the businesses have grown up there but I'm not sure that we can accommodate business parking you know, on those streets and still deal with our residents. Um, 
the skate park, I don't know that we'll get to 20 to 30,000 feet. Um, George, we went through this 20 years ago. <laughs> and um, we know how tough it is. But, you know, I think we're going to stand firm for skate facilities in this park because um, it's no different than basketball or it's no different than having a playground. It's a playground for a little bit for a different activity is what it is. So um, I would love to see us continue to build more. I hope we don't have to wait another 20 years before we even start to look at one. Um, I would like to see it maybe um, as we get to the planning phase, we do like we did um, for the skate park and have that, uh, that group that guided us. And look at ages. You know, we, we've built um, Skitters Point, but now what do we need? What, what are we missing? Is it the junior high kids? Are we um, looking for the neighborhood facility, not all the bells and whistles that we tried to have down there? Um, but it was tough to place in a neighborhood. So we, we're aware of what, you know, what comes. I like where it's located. I think it's not located in so close to the residents. It's kind of in the middle, so it's, it's a good protected. Real advocate for if we can get the splash pad in, just because we can keep it open when we don't have lifeguards. And it, it is a water feature for, um, for the younger kids. Uh, I'm pleased tonight to see that there aren't so many people. Thank you to staff for the meetings you've had. The fact that you've allayed people's fears about the sports facilities, I mean, the last meeting we had, there was a great fear that we were running the soccer players out or the baseball players out. And um, I think it says a lot to the meetings you've held that uh, people feel comfortable now. So that's good. Um, I think we'll fight out at some point this artificial turf versus natural grass. Um, it breaks my heart to drive by Ortega right now and see it fenced off. Um, Play, we're out for soccer games at Gersh Park on the weekend, and it is just dirt now because that you know that we're, we don't have fields, and it's not just Santa Barbara; it's our entire South Coast community. We don't have fields, so um, at some point we have to try it out on one of our highly used fields and come to some conclusions on it. But um, you know, everybody has a strong feeling about it. I am. I am a real advocate for figuring out, too, how we can phase this so that parts of it can get built as we get funding and the community doesn't have to wait for one gigantic piece um, because it's going to be expensive and that community has waited long enough for improvements. I really liked you presented, George, at um, NA, the Neighborhood Advisory Council about the sidewalk improvements. I think the access is tremendously important, and thank you for that, because I walked th around that area with a stroller a couple of weeks ago with a grandkid, and you can't get through. There, you know, the access is just not there. So these improvements, though they seem, you know, not the, the exciting ones like playgrounds and skate parks, are the ones that make a difference to a neighborhood. To be able for people to walk on that side of the street and get to CODA is important. So I'm really excited. I appreciate all the work, and I know you have done a lot of work to get this far and um, engaged with the community, and I thank the community for coming out and making it a better project at every meeting. So um, I truly support this um, strongly and um, Thank everyone for all the hard work. So, anyone else? No. Um, yeah. So I, I also went to the community meeting last week, and I was impressed with how incredibly responsive uh, Mr. Hannah and Thompson were to the comments they received. Just within a week, I see some changes to the plan and some more thinking. Um, I think you're actively engaged in um, the residents' concerns over wanting to maintain or re reinstill a sense of community in the park, and I think your design is going to do that. And there was, there was someone at the meeting last week, was it Mark Alvarado? No. Someone made a statement that, because um, some of the residents were worried about losing a sense of community because there wasn't all this unprogrammed space, and 
he said it's it's not a space and it's not a structure that give a sense of community it's the people that do that so I think if you make this a safe space by increasing program and activities that we want to see people are going to come back and they're going to bring that culture and sense of community with them so I'm also really impressed with the project and completely in support um, and I'm also going to stand with intent on skate parks I believe it it belongs there I'm not sure about increasing the size but if you look at our next CIP capital improvement project there is a skate skate park master plan uh, process in place so it's a subject we'll be revisiting um, I would make a motion um, that we recommend to City Council that uh, Parks and Recreation Department proceed with advancing the preliminary design of the proposed park improvements um, at Ortega Park. I'll happily second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Um, and that brings us to our proposed fiscal year 2020-25 Parks and Recreation Capital Improvement Program. Chair Clark and Commissioners, sorry for the technical challenges. I thought I would just pick it up and it would work. I'm going to, <laughs> I'm going to ask uh, Rich Hanna to advance the slides for me. Uh, I'm doing the presentation. Can we go back to the cover slide? Thank you. So. Although I'm doing the presentation on this item, what we want to present really is representative of a number of department staff that get together, not just once a year or once every two years, but we're working on these projects all the time. So you'll see many things in this presentation that you're familiar with. The opportunity tonight is to present kind of a whole package, sort of remember what we're working on, what we think we should be working on, what we think our priorities are, and some of our ideas about what it will cost. Could I have the next slide? So those of you who have been on the commission for a number of years know every two years we bring forward our capital improvement pro program. It's part of a citywide process. It's required under the city's charter. We take it through the budget process. It looks comprehensively of what about planned and projected needs. It provides a timeline for various phases. Again, it estimates costs and identified funding sources. Most importantly, we look at the first two years because projecting out five or six years is usually fairly challenging unless it's an ongoing you know, reinvestment in, in something that has a very static cost. So for, for parks and recreation and certainly for other departments, we look at what we're doing now, what those priorities are. We focus on unmet needs and in parks and recreation, we've got lots of those. Over the last 10 years, we've really tried to really focus on addressing some of the neediest ones. And with your last presentation, the last item, really take advantage of going, okay, how do we not only do those unmet needs, but also how do we plan for the future? And how do we do it in a way that allows us, sets us up to secure funding for our different projects? And so in our CIP, the objectives are to enhance our existing services, preserve our heritage and our resources, anticipate recreation trends, both um, new ones and repurposing existing ones, and the master plan's a, a key example of that. Consider changing demographics and how that would affect what we would do. And then, um, more often than not, how we layer over regulatory requirements as we upgrade areas. We have new codes and considerations um, for those areas. So for the next um, CIP, 
We have 38 projects. I'm including the projects that are in the Gulf Fund. There's five of those. We're in about $100 million is our current estimate if we were to do them all today. For the next two years, we're focused on 21 of those projects. And you can see from the numbers on the slide, pretty ambitious funding needs if we're going to move forward with all of them. Just over eight million next, sorry, that should say fiscal year 20 and 21, eight million and 11 million. And then similarly for the Gulf Fund, again, lot less money, but in the Gulf Fund, it's really focused on the amount of revenue that's generated in the Gulf Fund. So, so in the case of the general fund, we're not only looking at potential general fund sources, but other sources outside the city. The Gulf Fund, the capital program, really considers improvements that are based on actual revenues that come in on an annual basis. And then looking at the projects, we consider feasibility, cost, community need, uh, whether it's existing or in a new initiative. So first I wanna talk about projects to continue. None of these will surprise you, so we'll go through them fairly quickly. The Louise Lowry Davis Center we've been working on for a number of years. Um, it's been submitted to building and safety for a permit. As you know, because of the current dialogue around a future police station, it's just waiting there um, to proceed. If for some reason it was to proceed and funding could be available, we were ready to do that in the next fiscal year and our estimate for construction is about $3 million. And it's a comprehensive overhaul of the building, the facility, really taking the time to integrate the outdoor areas, the indoor areas and make it a much more usable and pleasant space. And then Bonnet Park, we had a joint meeting with the Commission and the Neighborhood Advisory Council on this project. We've made progress with our consultants. The park project has a number of great features, including increasing park access, enhancing it, picnic and play areas, uh, focusing on the landscape and, and the turf, expanding the ball court, and then renovating the restroom. We're currently expending around 200000 for design and construction drawings. It's funded, it's in our budget. We're looking at applying for a community development block grant application this year for the restroom renovation. And then if everything came together in fiscal year 2020, which is starts in July 1st, 2019, because we operate on a fiscal year, to build it, it would be $1.4 million, the full thing. That's our current cost estimate. As we move forward with the project, the cost estimates will be refined. Uh, but that would take care of really addressing everything that we think we need to do to upgrade and enhance this park and really a neighborhood park to, to serve the community more effectively. Dwight Murphy Field Master Plan, you had in your August meeting a discussion about that. We'll be bringing that back to you in the December meeting, what we've done to address the considerations and the thoughts about where all the different amenities would go. We currently have funding just to take us through where we are today for this project. So once we're done, and we would take it to council again, similar to Ortega, uh, we would pause until we had more funds allocated for the project. In the capital program, we're suggesting 500,000 to continue through the design work next year. And as you know, um, the Strong Foundation we've been working with, particularly around the accessible playground, starting a discussion with them regarding how and when they would begin their fundraising effort and how we could dovetail securing city resources with their resources and perhaps other sources of funds to move forward with the project. Uh, you'll see in 2021 this great idea that $6 million will come to fruition. Similar to uh, Chair, um, sorry, Commissioner Longstreet's thought that we could phase or take a park, this may be a location that we can also phase as well. And if you look at the CIP as it's proposed, it shows money over time, knowing that taking on something so ambitious, probably have to do it in phases. And then Ortega, I won't say any more because you just had your presentation and took action. Thank you for forwarding it to the city council. What we're showing here is half a million dollars in the next two years. We currently have enough funds to move, continue moving forward in this fiscal year. And in looking at the project design and talking with our project consultants, the pool design process is separate from the design of other aspects of the park. And so you can see we could focus on 
one area in one year and then carry into the next area. Granted, if we had a million dollars in the first year, we could really undertake it all at the same time, but being realistic about how to move it, move it forward. And then the West Beach Aquatic Facility, uh, work is continuing on that project, uh, and we've been before historic landmarks. The design team is refining the concepts, uh, and we will need some additional funds next year to really complete that design and be ready to move forward and complete construction drawings. Right now, the estimate could be about a $2 million project. In this, in this instance, the project, and, and it was mentioned um, uh, in the last presentation, as we delve into figuring these things out, realizing we need a restroom, realizing other aspects that are needed with this type of facility, but also taking advantage of the site so that it's not just a summer facility, it's not just a when it's warm facility, but really it's a playground that's year round, of which a period of time it's, it has spray features because it's warm enough for children to enjoy that. So in looking at the cost to actually build it, it's really like building a whole new little park. And then new projects, we always have to have a few of those. Chase Palm Park really isn't new. Uh, in the staff report in the capital program, it talks about upgrading our pathways, looking at upgrading Casa Las Palmas. We do have what's called a snack bar, but it's never been a snack bar. It's a little building next to Casa Las Palmas. The restrooms need refurbishing. Uh, there was also discussion in the capital program about building this Wisteria Arbor, which was an agreement that the city has had with the American tradition, which owns the adjacent property where a new hotel is going in. We're still, we, it may be that those funds are delayed, so that's why this slide and these numbers look a little bit different than what you see in your staff report. I wanted to bring that to your attention that in the last few days, um, we don't know yet whether the Department of Finance will approve its, those remaining uh, redevelopment agency funds for that aspect of the project that wouldn't stop us from wanting to move forward with other upgrades to the park. It is 20 years old. It is a very well-used, well-loved park. Uh, we do have uh, the area around Las Casa Las Palmas that we think could be improved in a way that makes it a friendlier, uh, perhaps uh, a safer or perceived safety would improve there and, it, and community use would be enhanced. Plaza Veracruz, uh, there's been a lot of discussion over the years about Plaza Veracruz. It's been a challenging site for a number of reasons. Uh, in the last couple of years, we've talked about how we really need to revision what it is. A, an open green space maybe isn't what it should be anymore. With downtown residential development increasing, looking at ways to activate that park to provide more active recreation opportunities. Maybe, and it is in your off-leash dog study, maybe it's a place to, to put in another off-leash dog area. The proposal for next year was, would be to begin scoping what that could be and do some conceptual planning and conceptual designs, similar to what we're doing now with the master plans, but scaled back. And then in 2021, taking those further to, for a further refinement. Municipal Tennis Center, uh, we just finished the playground. It's a project that was a long time in the making and uh, was very successful as well as the tennis area improvements, the access improvements, safety improvements. Uh, we have had on our list for a long time uh, increasing uh, court lighting. Um, and as you can see from this slide and from the, the program description, in the short term, we'd like to believe that really is feasible. We recently received a bequest from a family that enjoyed municipal tennis courts in their lifetime, and so they left a portion of their estate to the city to make improvements to tennis facilities. It actually, and it shows here on the slide that it's 200,000. We anticipate that there will be, there'll be more money than that. And so we're looking at, is that, is that what we would like to do, and is, is that what the tennis community would like us to do? Uh, we've heard from the pickle, pickleball community, they would like that too. Uh, so that's sort of a short-term um, objective. Long term, as it's been in our capital program for many years, the stadium, you can't, you can't really use it. You can't certainly use the, the sitting areas. Uh, we do need to replace it. We need to do something there uh, and, and really rethink how that whole facility functions and is used. 
Alameda Plaza, that's been our capital program for a long time. We're actually hopeful that, that we could, will be able to move forward with some what would be considered basic infrastructure improvements. The park entries and walkways could be more accessible. Uh, the lighting could be completely revamped. Signage as well. The gazebo has been managed in its state, but there's aspects that we could really improve there as well as improving the picnic areas. The two years of funding show how we would approach design and then phasing construction depending on what rose to the surface. Eastside Neighborhood Park, this is a project that's kind of new. Um, it's partly in looking at uh, the areas in our city where we have the potential to secure community development block grant funds. Um, in recent years, we actually, the playground that's there today was funded through the CDBG program. It's um, on the list for, for re renewal and refurbishment, but also in looking at the park as a whole, uh, restroom improvements, pathway improvements, the opportunity to improve access to and within the community garden, taking the time to really design, not necessarily on the, the scale of the master plan, but really looking at what we have and planning the whole thing. More like uh, Bonnet Park in the example there, uh, how we could plan c comprehensively what to do to bring that park up to a better standard and then look for ways to fund it, not just through the general fund, but also through community development block grants and potentially other sources as well. Creo Gym, uh, commissioners uh, a couple years ago went on a site tour and got to go upstairs to the rooftop court. We still have a dream that it can be reopened one day. And we have had in our capital program um, the desire to move forward with this project. Given the state of the building and the fact that it has historic significance for the city, for the community, it's right downtown. Uh, it doesn't have really any parking now, so it's not going to, but it's surrounded by parking. We are proposing that if it could be funded, we would undertake a feasibility study to figure out what, what do we need to do and how do we go about doing it? We did a similar, uh, had a similar strategy for the Cabrillo Pavilion back in 2010, 2011. The first thing we did is sort of just scope what's needed. That helps generate the idea of what you would actually move forward with and then what it would cost. And then the Parks and Recreation Master Plan, it's been a recurring project. Uh, so we're bringing it forward again. Uh, our approach to addressing our parks and recreation facilities. Uh, for the most part, over the last couple of years, we've really focused in on being very targeted with the community members that we reach out to and discuss specific improvements to specific parks. Um, this department as a whole hasn't had a comprehensive plan updated for many decades, and uh, we sorely need to actually look comprehensively throughout the city. We're successfully addressing our parks on a one-by-one -one basis, but really to plan for the future, to plan the next 30 years, 40 years, having a community-based process to really figure out how do we address all of our facilities. There's areas of our park system that are just trundling along, doing what they're doing, and, and aren't getting attention, but maybe through a master plan would rise to the surface from members of the community. So in the first year, the proposal is to do a community needs assessment and then also begin preliminary outreach. Uh, in the last presentation, Rich Hanna mentioned the number of meetings just around Ortega Park, and if you include tonight's meeting, we're at 17. Council will be at 18, and chances are there'll be another 18 or so before the project's built. That's good, uh, but this is also a way to really do some significant community outreach. And then ongoing programs, believe it or not, we are always trying to replace our playgrounds. Escondido Park would be a priority for next year, Eastside Neighborhood Park for the following year, and then park infrastructure, safety. Uh, we propose a set amount every year, and that just gives us the opportunity to go in and fix things in our parks. We have very little discretion, discretionary funds in our operating budget just to do little things here and there. And these funds, as we've had them over the years, and we haven't had an allocation for a number of years, have helped us put in a new fence, fix some lighting. In this case, um, this is at Willow Glen Park, it helped put in the new water fountain, which is 
child, adult, and for dogs as well. Things like that that just fall through the cracks if we don't have a source of funds for them. And then irrigation system renovation. We started this program a number of years ago. Most of our systems are 30 plus years old. Uh, we've successfully replaced them in locations like uh, Cabrillo Ballpark is part of that project. We put a new one in at Ambassador Park. Uh, Pershing Park is a number one priority for us. I was talking to Ken Brown um, in our parks division the other day and he reminded me that all the main lines are underneath the sidewalk. So if you actually have to go in and repair a main line, it involves sidewalk work, which doesn't make a lot of sense. It's time to actually rebuild the irrigation system, put the main lines in the turf so it's easier to access them. And then Chase Palm Park will be a priority for the following year. Other projects underway, as you can tell, our plate is pretty full. Cabrillo Pavilion, renovation projects, um, marching along. Thousand Steps renovation, uh, we're still actually in some of the design phase. We went to Historic Landmarks Commission back in July and um, have had to bring on an architect to do some additional design work to, to move that forward. And then we've been working on the Sustainable Trails program project at Parma Park, which is actually not funded through capital, it's through the Parma Park Trust, but it is a, par a large park endeavor, and so we qualify it that way. And then really quickly through the golf fund, these are sort of nuts and bolts projects. Um, looking at our golf course green and tee renovation, a lot of work has been done over the years. That's a high priority for the next two years. Um, they are really what's needed for uh, a good playable golf course. And then we have other aspects in our golf uh, CIP, which really are just day-to-day, year-to-year needs, um, whether it's looking at accessibility in roads, whether it's fixing up the restrooms. We, we just got uh, bids in for um, uh, repairing and replacing a number of the bunkers. There's a little bit more money that we want to spend next year. And then other aspects of the golf um, CIP, uh, working with Corsco, uh, believe it or not, replacing machines every year is a high priority because as you can imagine to maintain, you wanna make sure everything works. So again, we've, we've bumped up those numbers based on their desire and uh, given the success they've had with creating great golf conditions out there, it's obviously a priority to maintain. And then through our golf uh, advisory committee, we have the Players Improvement Fund which we're projecting to generate about $57,000 a year. This year, their funds are going towards the bunkers and meeting with them on a regular basis and looking at our capital program and planning it out. Uh, they participate in, in determining how to allocate those funds to the projects that we have. So with that, we would like to have a discussion with the commission. We would like your recommendation on this CIP uh, and then get you some, some preliminary thoughts on our priorities. We will bring this back to you as part of the budget process in April, so you'll see it again. And we'll have subsequent presentations between now and then, and it'll become clear which projects are even more ready to move forward. Uh, ultimately, through the budget development process, uh, we work with other city departments because general fund allocations for capital are rather slim. And so, there are other departments that have desires for funding. We like to put out a pretty comprehensive view of what we think it should be. And then ultimately, not everything obviously gets funding, but we have an idea of what our priorities are should the funds fall, fall our way. And then with that, I'd happy to, be happy to answer any questions and both uh, George and Rich are here to answer questions about specific projects. And Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you. Does anybody have any questions? Um, yeah, one thing that would help me, because I don't feel like we've done this recently, is looking at the park's budget for maintenance and things in relationship to these capital projects because we have a lot of planning going on but I think the Commission would benefit by the nuts and bolts of how we maintain what we have now so maybe in the future in January or February before we get into budget we can look at 
how our parks are maintained because uh, like Alameda Park, when we look at it, yeah, the gazebo and the walkways and that stuff, but I'm thinking of Alameda and Alice and do the, like Alice, do we need a whole planning process or do we just need money to go in and plant? You know, it's designed the way it's designed. The design is, is beautiful. But when we walk through it, the horticulture is tired. So how do, can we balance that so that, and can we advocate to council for general fund dollars that maybe take us a little bit away from these major planning and into keeping going what we have? I think um, we, we get kind of locked into a trap of um, planning and redoing when every year our maintenance budget gets slammed and has gotten slammed since now, this time, 2008. So that's a balance I'd like to see. Um, and I'm really excited about the Plaza Veracruz part. Um, it's a postage stamp park, but it is a postage stamp, it's historic, and it's in such a dense area, and I just, I so like the idea of, of figuring out how we reclaim it for use by um, a, quite a cross-section of people, so, uh, and make it safe, we just... Um, let's see, so those ones, you know, all of our neighborhood parks, I think, the safety aspects, all of those, you know, that I'm pleased to see that those remain every year, the, um, those projects. But, um, oh, the other part about Alameda, do we have a tree replanting plan for Alameda Park um, since that's what it's about? The Alamedas are our tree parks. How are we looking at replacing and phasing that all in. So, Chair Clark and Commissioners, I, I can sort of address a few comments and then answer that question. Certainly, the maintenance aspect of anything that we do is of critical consideration when we're developing um, park improvements. And the Parks Division staff are critical to the dialogue as we move a, move a project forward. Um, there are times where maintenance priorities have to change based on what we're trying to achieve. Uh, and then there are times, and what we did, for example, at Cabrillo Ballpark, where we scaled the, the landscape back to really framing the athletic components rather than being a standalone, because a park like Alice is really intensive to maintain. And the resources that were anticipated when it, it was constructed have never been there. Um, in the instance of Alice, we've looked at trying to make landscapes that are still horticulturally diverse and interesting, yet not as difficult to maintain. I would also say that since it, that type of park was developed, we've adopted our integrated pest management program, which makes it more challenging. It's a good thing to do, but there's, there's that rub. Um, as far as uh, Alameda, and now, of course, I've forgotten the question. Oh, the trees. Trees. I'm sorry. I was thinking to say, regarding Alameda, we actually work with the facilities division to, to look at maintenance of something like the gazebo, but not necessarily a full-scale overhaul. Uh, we'll be working with them on lighting and access, and that's an opportunity where we can partner with them. When it comes to trees, we did an inventory, uh, and I can drag that out and, and we can bring it back to the commission. We actually did an inventory of all the trees in our most what we consider our historic parks, tried to determine which ones were original, so planted originally, which ones were new, and where the, the change in canopy. In the case of Alameda, we found that the diversity of the trees changed, and we have a lot more palms, easy to plant, easy to grow, and that we were losing some of our very mature, very unique trees. The report does call out for developing a specific tree planting plan for that park. We have not initiated it yet, but it's certainly something that we could look at. I would, could, you know, if we have a, an inventory of what was there, could we go in and just replace without 
Chair Clark and Commissioner Longstreet, to the extent we've been able to document what was there, we've done that. The records aren't perfect. So we do have that. In some cases, and this is completely off the top of my head, um, I, I think I'd, we'd have to go back and look at the tree species list to determine could we then bring some of those trees back. In some cases, these parks have the one species that we have within our inventory. We have a lot of ones and twos. Uh, but we can, we can take a look at that and bring them back. And as far as Alice, yes, I think Alice is a unique park to our system. And, and I don't think we need to duplicate that kind of horticulture. But, you know, it is a unique experience to go to that park. And it, to go to that park, I think, with young children, is, it's pretty cool. And we don't have that. Well, we have a little bit of it in Chase Palm Park, you know, where you, you have the adventure of it. But um, it, it is a very, very special place, and I do appreciate that we were given that at some point for our inventory. Anybody else? I was, I was just slightly surprised when I looked at the, the, fi the general fund project's five-year and future needs summary, how other other city departments lists were so small compared to ours <laughs> and I was wondering is it, since I've been a commissioner we've always had a lot of unfunded infrastructure maintenance and safety projects has it always been that way? <laughs> Chair Clark and commissioners the short answer is yes uh, the, uh, but uh, at the same time a longer answer is a number of years ago to dig back in my memory, I want to say eight to ten years ago since I've been actively working on our general fund CAP for, I mean, no now, maybe 12 years. There was a, a, a real um, effort citywide to, to more accurately capture our infrastructure needs and to document not just fixing what we have, but what needed to take us into the next century. So, so yes, it's always been... We, in, in the last decade, we've always had this many projects. Um, they've changed. They've morphed slightly. Th some things we've gotten done. Uh, we've also found ways to better represent the needs of the infrastructure. Um, and then I would also add, in the last probably a similar amount of time, when the city first convened its infrastructure financing task force, I really started looking at what does this city need to do for not just today's residents, but the next few generations and beyond, because we have a lot of aging infrastructure. We haven't reinvested to the extent that perhaps we should have. And so the need and the number seems even larger as a result of that. Wouldn't you also say we... The Parks and Recreation manages a majority of the facilities, both um, open space. I don't think there's another department that has the facilities and the variety of facilities that we have. I also noticed that most of the drivers on the different projects were maintain and modernize and ongoing maintenance. It, it's just almost like we're putting out fires all the time. Um, Commissioner Armbruster? Yes. I was just going to say that I think there's, there's a lot of great projects on this list. And um, I know we've focused a lot on, you know, Dwight Murphy and Ortega Park over the last couple months, which I think are fantastic projects to move forward. But I'm also really excited to see things like the West Beach Aquatic Facility moving forward and the splash pads at both Ortega and West Beach, because um, I think there are some new things um, that our community could really utilize on here. So I'm excited to see them on here, and I hope um, they get funded. Commissioner Mingo? Uh, I think uh, for me, it's probably going to be just a question of clarity and maybe not understanding this chart as well as I should. But I'm back on the General Funds Project five year plus future needs summary. And I'm looking at the priorities, the high mediums and lows, and I'm 
struggling to reconcile that list with what I perceive to be the priorities that you guys are moving, or we all collectively are moving forward with and discussing. And maybe I'm missing something, but. <laughs> Chair Clark and Commissioner Miguel, the um, high, medium, and low allocation at least uh, from the department's perspective, is in response to what we're currently working on that we've been asked to work on by the community. A need, and it could, the application of high, medium, and low could vary based site by site. Uh, our belief that we have the ability to actually move forward and succeed with it thinking about the number of people that would actually use the facility and its improvements. Um, and then also um, direction that we've been given in terms of what a community priority. So there's not a clear criteria that's applied in the same manner for each project. Okay. Does that help you? It, it Do you have a specific a little bit. one you want to ask yeah, about? Yeah, I mean, okay, I'll just pull up. So for example, we've got um, Franceschi Park as a medium versus Alameda Plaza, Chase Palm Park, um, Oak Park, which seem to be much more um, densely used or frequently used as lows. And that, that, that's, that kind of confused me. Well, in the case of, in the case of Franceschi Park versus those other locations, those other locations can continue to be used as they are today. Franceschi Park has gone from low to median because we actually have funds in our capital to move forward with coming up for an alternative design for what is currently the house, which is in very poor condition. And therefore, there is this both a community need that we address it and then a council desire that we address it and funding allocated to to make it happen. If it was low, then it would be, well, then why are you holding money in the capital account if it's not that big of a priority? Is it high as high as Ortega Park or Dwight Murphy might be? No, because the use and the need and the desire to really revamp those locations is very high, and we have a lot of people in the community that want us to do that. Ultimately, when we complete something at Franceschi Park, which is to be long and complicated and costly, the number of community members that will be able to use that amenity is a fraction of these other locations. So there's a balance between it's medium because we've, we've set down a path to keep it moving forward, but it's not high as it relates to how it might be used and the benefit to the community overall. Yeah, I, I, I certainly understand the answer. I'm a struggle a little bit with that, that prioritizing or that method of prioritizing because it's sort of as we've got funding, therefore it's medium, but actually the community might benefit more from some of these other projects. It's, it's a tough balance. Yeah. But it's also, there's a, a part of it where, where it stands in the planning process. If it hasn't begun yet, it's kind of low still. It hasn't risen up to receiving any funding or attention yet. Where Franceschi has been sitting on that back burner for 20 years now, and it has some safety issues that we, uh, you know. So um, I think that like Oak Park and those are going to be major projects, community looking at them like we looked at, have been looking at Ortega. So you can't do those all at one time. So they have to wait till something gets moved, funded and moved. Otherwise, we have everything in progress and nothing completed. I have a question about um, funding. All of these are general fund projects. 
do we have on the horizon any park bonds statewide or other funding sources that will be available for some of these needed improvements? Chair Clark, Chair Clark and Commissioner Longstreet, yes. In, in some cases, we've tried to identify in here um, which projects where we believe there's opportunity for community development block grant funds. Uh, so we actively pursue those. And then, and then in the case of uh, Dwight Murphy, developing a partnership with the Strong Foundation. The Park Bond Act um, was actually passed um, recently. The state is still figuring out its guidelines as to how it will either allocate funds per capita and or competitively, and there's lots of different pots of money. Part of our objective, which I didn't include in the presentation in moving these projects forward, is often it needs to be ready to build to get the money. And so when you look at what we're working on, it's plan, plan, plan. But if, if we looked at where we were five years ago, it was planning as well. But we've also built a bunch of things since then. So we spend a number of years queuing everything up. And then we spend a couple of years getting things done. Kids World, that was 10 years. And often it can take 10 years, which is hard to believe. Uh, so in some cases, we anticipate that we will be eligible for and hopefully secure um, state grant funds. Every year in the city's legislative platform, we include in the importance of making sure that a lot of the federal funded programs like recreational trails, um, habitat conservation, stay funded, and it trickles down through the state. Thank you. We need a motion for this. Yes? Yes. Okay. Well, I would... Um, move that we recommend um, the proposed fiscal year 20 to 25 Parks and Recreation Capital Improvement Program. I'll second it. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So I, I skipped the last slide, but just, just uh, for the commission's reference again, the Planning Commission gets the entire city's CIP Finance Committee and Council look at it, uh, and then you again will see it as part of our budget presentation in April. And then in City Council will hear it as part of our budget presentation is then. So we anticipate that the, the list will refine a little bit maybe between now and April, pending city revenues and opportunities. We may know more about other opportunities in terms of funding. We'll be able to say, yes, we think we've secured this and this, so we want to move forward. And then we'll also will have advanced a lot of these projects a few more steps forward so it'll become even clearer the feasibility of, of, of taking advantage of funding in the next two years. And then ultimately, uh, the adoption process, the city will adopt a two-year plan, but they'll only allocate funds on a one-year basis. So can I ask one last question? Mm -hmm. um, since it's the first time I've looked at this particular um, document, um, is it, so you go first two years, it's like 8 million and 11 million in funds. Um, and then in the 20s, 22, 23, sorry, put it goes to 22 million or something like that, uh, ballpark. Is that, normally what you see as you look ahead in these long-range plans, because that's quite a sobering dif difference in what's really happening in, in a two-year term versus what you're mm -hmm. pushing out into the longer term. Chair Clark and Commissioner McGill, we are always very ambitious mm -hmm. um, because it helps frame where we are in a project and what we think could be done if the stars aligned. Uh, generally speaking, um, the funding that comes through the general fund is a fraction of that. Um, the city does have Measure C funds now. They're largely focused, as you know, on streets and sidewalks um, and, and the discussion around the police station. But sometimes there may be opportunities there to also help advance a park or a recreation project. 
And then there is an understanding within the city that we do, as, as uh, Commissioner Longstreet mentioned, we basically manage 50% of the city's mm -hmm. assets. Mm -hmm. So the needed funds are pretty clear. And then lastly, I mentioned briefly, the Public Works Department, through its facilities division, gets funds every year. And we work with them when there's a potential to allocate some of those funds to our facilities to either add to what we think is important or we add to what they think is important. So, there's, so, so sometimes the funds could come from a, a few different locations. It's a little dynamic. But if, like I said, if, if the world was our oyster and we could move all of these things forward, we have some projects that will require significant financial investment. We think it's important to keep moving them forward because we anticipate we can be successful. So if the uh, stars aligned, the miracles occurred, et cetera, et cetera, and $22 million worth of projects were approved in that three-year out time frame, is your department, I mean, can you actually do that? Details, details, no. <laughs> Chair Clark and, and Commissioner Miguel, that's a great question. Uh, we, in the last 10 years, uh, uh, there's been a key focus in building the department's capacity to move projects forward. Uh, so we do take on a pretty ambitious workload. We also, uh, share that workload with public works staff. They step in and would manage a project during construction. Uh, and then we also take advantage of a lot of technical support and consultants that mm -hmm. do a lot of the initial heavy lifting. Certainly if we found ourselves in a position where we had more work than we anticipated, in addition to available city resources, we could secure other resources to move them forward. And then some of those big numbers is, is the construction. Mm -hmm. It doesn't cost that much to design it and get it to construction. A prime example is the Cabrillo Pavilion. It was a little over a million to get it to breaking ground, and the actual cost is tremendously more than that. It's 16 million. So. Some of those numbers look really large because it's actually what we anticipate it will cost us to bring a contractor on board to build it. Thank you. Uh, with that, we'll adjourn this meeting. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.